question would be about the political makeup of the INR. Uh, it's obvious that uh, the, the makeup of the shares that each country has dependent on its quota is already political because one can see that uh, Japan has a more share than China, which doesn't reflect the size of the economy, but it reflects a political standpoint. Uh, how is the how can a country feel this political orientation of the IMF? Because one can easily say, okay, it's an American tool, but it's a more complex issue than just being an American direct tool for foreign policy. Mm. How can a country like Lebanon feel uh, this uh, political makeup? Good question. Um, it helps to understand how the decision making happens. And I already described the fact that the institution has a professional staff that is very, very large, but it has a board that is 24 people. Um, eight represent their their own their home country and nobody else. UK, France, Germany, United States, China, Russia. Um, and the other board members that would leave um, 16 represent groups of countries or constituencies. Mm -hmm. um, African countries, for example, uh, have two constituencies. 45, I think, uh, com uh, countries are covered by two people who's uh, usually appointed by the country with the biggest quota share. Mm -hmm. The IMF makes no major decisions cannot make a major decision unless 85% of the voting quotas uh, are agreed. The United States alone has enough to block any decision as a result. Uh, they have 16%. Precisely. And that's less than their economic footprint globally. But they've given their extra because once you have enough to block, you don't need any extra. <laughs> um, in, in, in regular uh, reform processes, which every time, instead of taking five years, take a bit longer. So now I think we're several cycles behind where we need to be because of the inherently political nature that you described. For example, I believe that the technical calculation is, it's, uh, it's not, it's a formula which is designed when you have the answer first. Yeah. not the opposite way around. And why? Because, for example, you always have these features, not just as like what you described about Japan, but France and the UK are almost have the exact same outcome. And it's meant to, cal to calculate not just economic size, but how integrated you are in the world economy and other factors like this. So the other critical factor to understand about these unequal board members, and there really is a lack of equality between them, is that they are executive directors. Mm, the managing director currently, Kristalina Georgieva, which is always a European for old historical reasons that don't have any basis in, in, in sort of technical merit. Um, she chairs the board, but the executive board members make decisions. Huh. This is not non-executives. This is not the institution having the final word. It is its shareholders having the final word. It is not run like a corporation where the chief executive, you know, is usually the boss, but rather it is the shareholders. And that's the term they use themselves. So when a country like Lebanon confronts an inst this institution, it is negotiating with many different people, sometimes indirectly. First of all, it needs to find a, an acceptable uh, route forward that the staff will endorse. But it needs to know immediately at the same time, quite frankly, that the there is uh, enough consensus at the board level that what the country wants and what they hope to convince the staff is acceptable will be acceptable to the board. All of this can be accompanied by bilateral conversations, including with the United States and other allies to make your case. And how I understand these negotiations occur is often a lot of this corridor negotiation. Why corridor? Because it's not public. Yeah. The reason it may seem strange that I talk so much about this voting power, because very rarely does the board vote. 
In fact, it's this core contradiction that I wanted to highlight. The board doesn't vote because it's so important to present decisions as a consensus because that's more consistent with it being a technical institution. Yeah. So, very, so it's highly politicized and extremely risky to disagree. For example, the Brazilian executive director during the Greece crisis, who had spoken quite articulately and angrily, this is under the Lula administration, not the current administration, yeah. um, about the injustice of providing so many resources, huge numbers were being provided to Greece and other countries in the Eurozone from the IMF, and yet for pennies relative to this, countries in the, the global south had had huge transformations of their economies effectively imposed upon them. Yeah, in order to be accepted. Yeah, and uh, as a result, this particular director um, abstained during one of the meetings that was meant to be a rubber stamp. And uh, he wasn't director for very long, especially when the governments changed, put it that way. But the so the the importance of understanding the functional power within the institution is 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 really uh, uh, I can't over uh, uh, emphasize. However, how the institution presents itself often obscures it masks how that process works. And there's a very deliberate choice in that. And I think this is why I can say the IMF is doing the opposite in different settings. Why? Because it's internally a place where different departments can disagree, where different countries are pushing for different outcomes at the board and they're negotiating. So it's almost like the place where they talk it over and the rest of us citizens and civil society often don't have any access to that. And that's really where I feel it is a really illegitimate and problematic institution. And, and why, you know, I've spent my work doing what I do. That doesn't mean economic problems like Lebanon has and confronts aren't serious or real. It's just that we would need, um, I think, uh, uh, it's long overdue that we had support to countries in a genuinely more open and solidarity based way. And we can mm -hmm. see that when geopolitics over overcomes um, um, the sort of ideological or or when when the crisis is so acute that these simple safe solutions that work for them but not for anybody else are, are, are themselves become redundant. Uh, I said that it was the last question. I lied. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> more more. <laughs> yeah, just small questions and then maybe the the later the latter one can be a long question, but just a small uh, clarification. Uh, usually, when a country has a program with the IMF, usually it doesn't, uh, it's not the rule, but usually uh, during a crisis, a country has several IMF programs. That's right. So uh, it's, it's certainly very common and some countries have a chronic relationship. If I can use my health or illness metaphor again, okay. it is a chronic relationship with the IMF and in effect, my point about how it's somehow new, the IMF is becoming more long term and structural. That's a little bit uh, untrue, because in a way, when you look at its relationship to certain countries and um, Pakistan, for example, which has recently had the, 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 the I think it's 13 loans in 30 years and usually the loans are for three years. So 13, I mean, how can that work out or it's recurring? And many of the loans themselves carry the last ones into them and mentioned Argentina as well. And um, a mix of factors and, you know, immediately you can think Argentina is not an insignificant state. It's large. It's G20 member in Pakistan for lots of geopolitical reasons um, is a state. Perhaps Turkey is another example more close to Lebanon in regional terms and, and, and maybe many of your viewers will be more familiar with its recent history that it also has this characteristic. And of course, the IMF becomes very hated and, and, and very well known. I think in the elections in Argentina, you've had campaign slogans saying, you know, thanks to me, your kids don't know what the letters IMF stand for. And that was an Argentine campaign broadcast um, saying we haven't had them here for a, at least 10, 15 years. Um, 
So this uh, this quality of uh, repeat loans, I suspect, and if you look at the, how much it's happened, is is something the IMF themselves know very well and and probably internalize in terms of saying we want to uh, uh, we will accept only X Y Z in terms of degrees of cuts, fiscal or economic targets that cause so much hardship. Um, mm. But they may not, but they may well be, and this is me speculating, well aware that that's not politically possible. And maybe another government or two uh, down the line is finally going to get there and the IMF is just going to keep mm. pushing. And why is it the IMF doing that? Because the board has decided it's that's acceptable in a country with nuclear weapons like Pakistan. Maybe they've often said, no, no, we'll 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 close the eyes to this and we'll waive that. You know what I mean? Because yeah. there's obvious other considerations that the major shareholders have. Um, and I think we've seen that in the last decade in places like North Africa and Egypt um, in particular, uh, where uh, the IMF's usual stringency was not quite as apparent. And I sus my suspicion is, you know, or that it's a part of this bigger pattern that many have documented academically, and even the IMF's own independent valuation office has talked about um, uh, problems of, uh, you know, overly optimistic forecasts of its own deals and so on, which means that it pretends like it didn't know they would be back at the negotiating table in short time. Mm.